Lord, I ask now as we uh, look at your word, as we unpack it, Lord, we hear you this morning speak to us. Or this afternoon now, Lord, we hear you telling us what you think. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So, hmm, um, sorry, I've just had a moment. Uh, this, uh, I wasn't going to do this, I'm going to do this later, but I get a feeling we've got to do this now, this clip. Um, just need to explain this, this is not of my instigation, this is of Chris's instigation. Uh, a quick background before we do anything. Uh, this clip is on, you'll hear, is on, was on UCB radio uh, last week. A member of this church uh, heard this on UCB radio, then subsequently sent it to uh, one of the staff team, who then <coughs> sent it to me and said, you've got to listen to this. And then that was it. I happened to play it last Sunday afternoon to Chris because just, just did, just thought, you want to listen to this, this is pretty cool. And then she said, I believe the church should hear this. So, here you go. Break me down on UCB1. It's 20 to 7. Let's get tonight's thought from Steve Apple. Rousing the Warriors is the title of tonight's message in Church Awake. Church Awake with Steve Apple. Welcome to Church Awake. Let me read to you right from the start. Joel chapter 3, verses 9 to 11. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Rouse the warriors, let all the fighting men draw near and attack. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weaklings say, I am strong. Come quickly, all your nations from every side and assemble there. Bring down your warriors, O Lord. I've been preaching from this passage since I was about 13 years old. And it, it basically is a declaration to the nations to get ready for a big fight. And, and the, the word coming, rouse warriors, let all fighting men draw near and attack. And then take your tools for farming, maintenance, and turn them into weapons of warfare, advancement. It's a call to move out of maintaining into a place of advancing. I believe that this is a very prophetic word for the church today to move out of our comfortable maintenance modes and to move into a place of advancing the kingdom of God in, in the communities where God has planted us, in our individual homes and workplaces, colleges, universities and schools, and also across nations. It even says that the weaklings say, I am strong. Because you know, some of you will say, I will say, I actually don't feel very strong right now. I don't feel like fighting right now. I'm just struggling to survive my own life. But when you respond to the word of God and say, God, make me into a warrior, I no longer just want to maintain, I want to advance. The Holy Spirit will come and help you to do this. And there's a sense of urgency. He says, come quickly, all you nations from every side and assemble there. God, bring down your warriors. I really believe it's time for the church of Jesus Christ to take on a militant attitude. There are so many names of God. The Jehovah Sabbath is used more than 200 times in Scripture for God. The God of armies. The God of war. Exodus 15, 3, the Lord is a warrior. Matthew 11, verse 12. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force or, or, or is forcefully advancing in the New King James is forcefully advancing and forceful men and women lay a hold of it. I really believe that we need to leave some of our passivity behind, some of our niceness behind and become militant. Now, not with physical weapons, not with rudeness, but in the spirit realm to be able to take the territory that God wants us to live. It is a it is a challenge for the church to rise up and boldly advance the kingdom of God instead of withering and dying and just holding on until Jesus comes. We are supposed to be advancing and growing in glory. Ah, I, I get really stirred about that. I could say a lot. I want to encourage you, if you want to learn more about that, I've written a book called Rousing the Warriors, and you can get that on Amazon. And uh, it's available as a, a, as a paper book and also as an e-book uh, for your Kindle or iPad. I encourage you, get a hold of it, read it, allow it to impact your life, and say, God, turn me into a warrior. So... Beyond the uh, slight sale book uh, plug at the end, which I don't like listening to them because you sometimes go, oh, well, that's it, I'll shut the rest off, the guy's trying to sell his book. Um, that's not the case here. I've actually heard Steve Uppel myself before, not on this particular subject. Um, uh, he's a senior pastor in a church in uh, Wolverhampton. And I sat there when I heard it for the first time in my office, I just went, that's all the language I've been using. Stop being nice. It's time to us to advance. 
So I just thought you'd like to hear that. Uh, well, Chris, sorry, let's rephrase that. Chris would like to hear it. I wanted everybody to hear it, but I didn't want to instigate it, if that makes sense. And I wasn't spreading it around, hoping somebody will pick up on it. Um, uh, but uh, let you cogitate on that. And that's all that was about. So, last week, I gave you a clue to what we learnt last week. Well, I told you one of the things we learnt about gyrus. Having... <sighs> Let's work this out. That was less than an hour ago that I recapped something you should have learnt last week to which everybody, a chunk of you responded to. Yeah, I'm going to nag. What else did we learn from last week? Can we remember? It was in Mark chapter 5. Or shall I just quickly run through it for you? Who was here last week? Oh, it's, woo. right, so you're going to admit, can you remember? <laughs> Go on, Dennis. Oh, yeah, talking to oh, this, right, it makes right. life easier. Go on. Uh, Jairus had humility, and he looked beyond his own life. He looked for authority, is that right? Yeah. Something of authority. Cool. Anybody else? Jesus wants a relationship with each and every one of us. Amen. Sorry, coming through. Mind your knees. We need to stand up. We need to not be worried about being embarrassed for our faith. Amen. We need to be counted. Anybody else? Dennis, you want one more? Are we willing to let go of our pride so that someone else could be touched by Jesus? Absolutely. Are we willing to let go of our pride so somebody else can be touched by Jesus? Jairus put us everything down. He didn't care what anybody thought about him. Yep, he truly did. Cool. Don't know why I carry that. Don't need it anymore. Yep, for me, that's uh, the other thing also for me was that healing does actually, miraculous healing as we like to call it, does actually occur. Uh, there were, and uh, it can occur today in today's society it can occur today in even in this building second of all if you remember the jostling crowd trying to guide Jesus to where they want him to minister so one of my things was we need to have be stop being distracted by those who want to fulfill their own little agendas is the other thing so brilliant okay well we're going to launch into mark 6 6b to verse 30, but I'm only going to read to verse 13. And then after that, we're going to start imagining ourselves a little bit, okay? Okay? Look, you're going to get 10 minutes less of me. So, here we go. Then Jesus, and strangely enough, you're going to notice how this really interlinks with street pastors. Then Jesus went from village to village teaching the people and he called his 12 disciples together and began sending them out two by two, giving them authority to cast out evil spirits. He told them to take nothing for their journey except a walking stick, no food, no traveller's bag, no money. He allowed them to wear sandals but not to take a change of clothes. Wherever you go, he said, Stay in the same house until you leave town. But if any place refuses to welcome you or listen to you, shake its dust from your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned these people to their fate. So the disciples went out, telling everyone they met to repent of their sins and to turn to God. And they cast out many demons and healed many sick people, anointing them with olive oil. Probably one of, uh, again, one of those, you tend to know it, the sending of the twelve. Jesus sent them out. Sent them out pre-death and resurrection of Jesus, which is always fascinating. Not going to unpack all of that behind that this morning. 
So I keep saying this morning, but it's quarter past 12. Um, this afternoon. I just want you to do this. Imagine yourself for a moment. You've been with this exceptional rabbi called Jesus. You have seen him perform miracles, healings, casting out demons, raising the dead, telling stormy nature to shut up. He's had the most authoritative teaching that you could imagine. And conflict with the local religious leaders. You've been in the middle of jostling crowds and been sent away by Gentiles. And all after accepting a call from this man to follow him and to learn from him. You left your cosy lifestyle, what you knew, and boy, you find yourself in a place that you just couldn't have imagined in your wildest nightmares. Could be considered the business trip of dreams, couldn't it? And then this moment happens. You've been going from village to village with him, and then the next minute you know, you get summoned by Jesus to his office with the rest of the church, which is not very big at this moment, consists of 12. Come on in. Take a sofa seat in my office, says Jesus. You start wondering, is this appraisal time? Do I need to give feedback on how I think I am doing? Right, come on in. Appraisals back eight years plus ago in my day when I was in business was an absolute nightmare. You had to write first how you thought you were doing. Does that still exist? Yes. Amen. Amen. Yeah, it gets cool, lots of things. Right, anyway, moving on. So you think it's appraisal time. You have to give feedback about how you are doing in this little team of company, this little department in the company of Jesus of Nazareth. Then all kind of concerns start going through your mind. Have I performed enough for him? Have I learned enough? Or is he going to tell me off for my screaming reaction in the boat in the middle of the storm? Or my lack of understanding of his parables. Or the way I reacted to that jostling crowd in a really nasty behaviour and had a go at them. Is Jesus going about to tell me off? Give me a verbal warning. The rest of this department seem to not have a problem. They all seem to have it sorted. Or so it appears to you. Oh, well, I'm ready to plead my case. I'm ready to beg for forgiveness and hope that I can restore myself into his good books. So there you are in the presence of Jesus with your companions. You think you're in trouble because you've been discussing your fears with them on the way there. Anything sounding familiar at the moment? Then Jesus says, Right, you and you pair up, 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 you and you pair up. And it goes through everybody there, getting them to pair up. My mission on this planet, says Jesus, is not all for me to do. I need you to represent the company. It's visions, it's goals. So I'm entrusting you and giving you all authority to cast out unclean spirits, to heal people. No, Dr. Luke, not with bandages, but with power. And clearly the company message, the strap line must be sold, which is repent for the kingdom of God is here. Turn to God. And he says, okay, you got it? Off you go. You sit there thinking, no, hang on a minute, that's not what I expected. All right, the, 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 come on, I've done something wrong already. You must be telling me off right now, surely. Come on, I've told you how I think I'm doing. I think I'm doing really, really rubbish. 
and I trust me I wanted to use another word but I better not I feel rubbish I must have done something wrong that you wish to tell me off about right now Jesus before you send me back out into the department back out into the office that's all he said so far and then he goes oh yeah and you go ah oh, here it comes Final instructions. Take only a walking stick for beating the wild animals away, not the wild humans. Wear your best sandals, or Doc Martins, or whatever you wear, for the rocky roads that are ahead, and boy, there are going to be some. But don't take a change of clothes. Yeah, I know. Also, no food, no traveler's bag, no money. There is no expense account and no staying at hotels. No, go from village in village, like we've been doing, or from door to door, neighbour to neighbour. Find a reliable and accepting home and stay there throughout the time that you're in that village. Or a reliable neighbour, a nice neighbour, who might welcome you in for a cup of coffee or tea. Yeah, but you say, but if we aren't welcome in that place, what do we do then? Jesus said, well, it is like cold calling. You will get the door slammed in your face a few times. But you've done it to others, haven't you? Yeah. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. So shake the dust from your feet as you leave. And if they've got any means of interpretation, they know they have just allowed something to leave them they shouldn't have done. And you have left them to their own fate. So that's it. My instructions are done. Off you go. Uh, but, 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 but you say, we've not done this yet before. I haven't had the right training. I don't think I'm capable. I'm not good enough yet. You see how I react to the simplest of things, Jesus, when it doesn't go my way? Boy, I can be so easily distracted by my own things, my own fears, my own company. I don't know what to do. You can't use me. Look at me, I sit on my desk after about 45 minutes and start looking up the BBC news, pretending I'm working. Or play Jenga or whatever that cascading thing. Tetris. Anybody ever done that in the office? I know you do that in the sermons. So. <laughs> I can't, Jesus. And then Jesus says, I know. But you missed the point. You're part of this team, part of this department, part of this company, because I chose you. You didn't choose me. You didn't do the interview. I just chose you. Do you remember the application form you had to fill out? Because I didn't. I didn't ask for references from anybody else. I chose you. Waltz. Faults and all. And I have seen you grow. You may not see it, but I do. I know the potential my father has put in you. And he is slowly, surely bringing that out. Secondly, it's my authority, says Jesus, and under my instructions that you are going. It's about me, not about you. It's what I can do through you if you allow me. If you're willing to abandon yourself into my care and into my trust. Hence the reason you shouldn't really take anything like extra clothing or money is his total reliance on me. Talking to me, listening to me, 
using my authority and my power in humility and not using your knowledge and your false authority to get things done. Just abandon yourself to me. Let go of your life. Look at John the Baptist, which, by the way, is in verse 14 to verse 30 afterwards. Look at John the Baptist. We know that he's been beheaded by that lust-filled, paranoid sister-in-law marrying Herod Antipas. Interesting name. All because he fancied his stepdaughter's swaying hips. But see what John did. He never worried about himself. He never worried about his life, where his next meal was coming from, or what people thought of him. He never worried about whether he was going to live or die today. He proclaimed repentance and challenged the high and mighty and the low and needy in their behaviour with complete abandonment to God. That's the life I'm calling you to, says Jesus. Following me, taking up your cross is about cost. It may actually cost you your actual life. If you love your life beyond loving me, we are going to struggle. Do as I command. Have a part of me. I can't use you if you don't... I can't use you in the ways that God, you desire me to use you. Abandon yourself upon me. Stop thinking about what you can't and can do. Think and focus on me. It's what I can do and will do through you if you trust me. Now, who would like company instructions like that? Who would like empowerment like that from their management? To say, get out there, go do it. You've got the full authority of the company behind you. You do it in my authority, says Jesus, it will happen. It's that thing, isn't there, uh, in the thing that called headhunting. You can be headhunted by other companies if you're seen as to shine brightly within the industry. And companies sometimes headhunt you. They make phone calls to try and get you to, uh, uh, to come and join their company. But you still have to go through the interviewing process. The whole being checked and double-checked and made sure that actually what they believe to be true is true. What I love about Jesus is he just doesn't do any of that. He asks for one reference and one reference only. Your life. And for, let's say, an average 80-year lifespan and the pension scheme is eternity with him, it's not really a great cost, is it? And what he says when he chooses you and say, I do everything through you. It's about me and what I can do. It's not about you. I didn't ask you to come with a whole raft of qualifications or come with a whole raft of training behind you. What I asked you to do was come and just be with me. And from that, everything else will flow. Honestly, I really believe those disciples really sat there at one point and thought, because I've got to say, being with Jesus probably wasn't the most comfortable thing in the world. I do wonder sometimes if you, every time we went for meal time with him, you thought, okay, where am I going to be challenged today in my thinking? But how many people panic getting called into the office of their boss? Yeah, come on, let's all admit it. But to have your boss just turn around and say, oh, by the way, uh, this is what we want to do now. I want you to do this. I'm basically promoting you. Can you go out and do this in my authority? That's it. No telling you off. No having a go at you. Just go and do this. That's God. That's God. Is that sinking in somewhere?
I want you to consider just for a minute. Almost like a child. We'll use that. That actually a child, when the parent says, go and do this, a little child, I'm not talking teenager. <laughs> a little child. <laughs> Speaking he, a father of a teenager. But when you ask a little child to go and do something and say, and it's something they may not have done before, but you say, if you want to go and, I don't know, go and get the butter out of the fridge, let's just use something random. A child doesn't go, oh, but I've been naughty a minute ago, haven't I? They don't argue with you, do they? They want to test out the new experience. They want to go for it. So they go, oh, I've been given something. Mum or dad or whatever's actually allowed me to go to the fridge and get something out. Oh, this is exciting. We have our God saying to us, go out, my children, and go and do this stuff you read in the Bible. And we should all be going, yes, Father. I'm excited. Like a child, accept it simply that you can do it because the Father has said so. And as if a child drops the butter, you don't have a go at them. You say, well, no, you don't have a go at them. You shouldn't do. You just go, that's okay. We'll clear up the mess and we'll try again. Do you get the point? No child sits there and goes, no, no, there's multiple reasons why I can't do this, Father. Allow me to go through them with you. Firstly, I've never had the training. Being taught, I'm not quite sure which fridge you're talking about. Yes, I know you've pointed to the one over there, but are you sure? I'm not exactly sure how to open the door. Oh, you've shown me that before, haven't you? I just pull on the handle. Yes, that's true. But I'm not sure which tub of um, margarine you want me to go and deal with. Well, there's only one tub of margarine in the fridge. It's clearly evident which one I'm pointing you to. Now, you take that into us as adults. Lord, I'm not quite sure which area in the department or which person you want me to go and talk to about you. I'm not quite sure how to actually open up the conversation with them. Oh, yeah, you have told me about that. You just be normal and just talk. Um, I'm not quite sure which person it really is. Oh, there's only one person you're really fully pointing out to me right now. They're the only tub of... I've just related people to tub of lard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's good, isn't it? But you get the point. We argue the toss. And we are asked to accept the kingdom like little children. That's not about being big babies and throwing your toys out the pram. It's about accepting it in the faith of a child who says, I'll just go and do it. It's interesting for me how children don't tend to worry about dangers. There are times you wish they would, but they don't. If you, as a loving parent, have turned round or you as a child receive from your loving parents or carers have turned round to you and said, go and do this, I trust you. You, oh yeah, great, I'm off. God, our loving parent, our loving father, by the way, I come back to the fact it's not all wishy-washy, mushy love, all right? It's a real love, it's, anyway. But our loving father at the moment, he's saying, children, Go. And I don't care if you're as young as me or older than me. I'm still trying to believe that I'm young. I've discovered I'm going deaf now. <laughs> but you get the point. Are you actually understanding that? I chose you, says Jesus. Note that I chose you. You didn't do any choosing. You wouldn't be in this room if you chose Jesus, trust me. If you had to make the first choice, Jesus would have been your last one. The reason you're in the relationship you're in with him is because he chose and pinned you down first. You just went, yeah, I surrender. But it's a continued surrender after that with him. 
continually taking up the cross. But he chose you. So, the reason for John the Baptist is proving here in Mark that it was a sandwich. He was trying to prove the fact that actually discipleship does involve cost. But I love verse 30 at the end. The apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told them all that they'd done and taught. I would love our testimony times here to be a Sunday morning. I'd love the entire Sunday morning to be entire testimonies from beginning to end where everybody's queuing to say, do you know, this week, this week, I prayed for somebody who needed healing of a broken hand or something and they were healed. Somebody in my neighbourhood who's been causing nothing but grief and we realise he's actually some demonic. We've prayed them out, released them and they've now come to know Christ and here they are and they want to be baptised. Do you see the point? I could scrap preaching for a whole year. (laughs) If that was what the preaching and the teaching we were going to have with every one of us here up the front saying what Jesus is like. I was with street pastors. And this woman had a cut foot because they're high heels. I don't have that problem. <laughs> cut foot. We prayed over it and actually sealed and healed. And then we gave her a flip flops. Do you see what I'm trying to get at? Our testimony time should be about what we have done for the other person. What God has done through us, his children, there. And he's saying, Go! Because I chose you. <coughs> Problem is, I think we still don't think we've been chosen. We did it at our baptism. We might have done for about the first six weeks of it. And then afterwards, all the excitement died down, which happens to every single one of us. And then we start seeing all the bad stuff that we do, and we forget actually that's the Holy Spirit just helping us to be sanctified is a nice big word. But we then focus on that and forget the fact actually, oh, Jesus couldn't have chosen me, look how bad I am. Yes, he did. That's the reason he chose you. Because you needed it, just like we all do. You needed the redemption. You needed all the good stuff that's in there to come out. And that wasn't going to come out why you sat with your bad stuff. So I'd like you all to stand if you can, if you're able to. Just for a moment, talk to God for yourself. Allow him to actually say to you and believe the words when he said, I chose you. It feels like it's a call for, a morning for altar calling. And what I mean by that is this. It's about also abandoning ourselves to him. Imagine saying, yeah. I need to entrust in you, throw myself at you, and just go, yes, Lord. Now, some of us will all be sitting there going, or standing there, saying, Yeah, but, yeah, but, I do want to, but I'm struggling because I know how I think about this. And God might be saying, that's fine. Come forward, let me help you with that. Make a mark in the line about that. We want to see Jesus lifted high in this nation, yes? It doesn't happen unless we do it. So I'm asking you now to respond to Jesus as you see fit. Lord, Heavenly Father,
just thank you for the Quakering steps forward, responding to your call to be used by you. Of your faithful children. Lord, I thank you that when you call us into your office throne room, you're not calling us in to tell us off. The appraisal's already been done on the cross. You're calling us in to say, and I want you to go and do this because I chose you. And Lord, I want to pray for those who step forward, Lord, that actually what they get, more than anything else in the name of Jesus, that you have chosen them. And in that, Lord, Heavenly Father, as they recognise the cost and abandon themselves to you, fill them with your spirit, Lord. Anoint them with all that we read about in the Bible. Anoint them with the gift of healing. Anoint them, Father, in the name of Jesus, with the gift of casting out evil spirits. Anoint them, Lord, with the gift of knowledge. Anoint them with the gift of the prophetic. Lord, anoint them with the gift of speaking your word directly into people's lives. Anoint them with the gift of hospitality, the gift of love. All equally powerful in the name of the Spirit and through the Son. Lord, as they've stepped out, they have declared themselves before you. They have allowed themselves to be seen like this. Lord, bless them, encourage them as we know you are, because you are the loving parent, the loving father. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.